exciting thing about Wittgenstein, your proof, is that there is no, literally, or hardly any theory of truth that has not been ascribed to Wittgenstein. The later Wittgenstein, for example, has been credited, if that's the right word, with propounding a consensus theory, propounding a coherence theory, propounding a verificationist theory. And very often I have the feeling that the sole motivation behind these uh, attributions to Wittgenstein is the feeling that since he was a weird and exotic uh, philosopher, he must have had a weird and exotic account of truth. Uh, it seems to me that's entirely wrong. Uh, I think the truth of the matter as regards Wittgenstein is that the early Wittgenstein uh, held a sophisticated version of the correspondence theory of truth, whereas the later Wittgenstein pioneered the deflationary theory of truth. At least that's what I used to think. Um, and I still think that both of these claims are defensible, uh, but I think that the matter is far more complicated than I thought at one time. But one thing that I'm absolutely certain of is that Wittgenstein's account of truth lies fairly and squarely within the mainstream of uh, analytic philosophy. It's a realist account of truth, realist in the simple sense that it makes truth independent of what people say or believe. And that seems to me uh, really the most important part in it. If I may do my bit in uh, a certain rapprochement between Wittgensteinian philosophy and mainstream analytic philosophy, then you know, that would be my, my attempt to do so. Um, in uh, the talk itself, I will mainly focus on the Tractatus because I think that's where, firstly because I haven't finished my research on the later Wittgenstein, uh, for which I shall need the, you know, the, the Berger edition, uh, and secondly because I think most of the important moves are made in the early Wittgenstein. <coughs> so uh, my talk will be you know, addressed mainly to uh, the Tractatus, but we can uh, raise the issue of later remarks in the discussion. Um, so, you know, I, I hope you all have a handout, a double-sided handout, and I shall also make use of uh, the overhead. Right, now the Tractatus contains a correspondence theory of truth. That, at any rate, seems to be the consensus both among theorists of truth and among Wittgenstein commentators. <coughs> and this situation by itself, this agreement, should, you know, uh, should come as a surprise because you know, usually when a theorist, let's say a theorist of meaning, attributes to Wittgenstein a certain theory of meaning, he will be savaged by Wittgenstein scholars. Uh, you know, the first group of scholars will say, well, he didn't hold the A theory of meaning, he held the B theory of meaning. And the second group of Wittgenstein scholars will say, no, 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 he didn't hold any theory of meaning because he was opposed to theories as, as such. And the third group of Wittgenstein scholars will say, well, and incidentally, he undermined the very notion of meaning. And, you know, uh, at that stage, then the mainstream analytic philosopher will have lost interest, not in meaning, but in Wittgenstein, possibly. Uh, but when it comes to truth and the tractatus, the Wittgenstein commentators have played the game, so to speak. They have agreed that, uh, you know, there is a correspondence theory of truth in the tractatus. Uh, the received story is roughly, uh, correspondence theories invoke a notion of correspondence between thought and reality, that the relation is uh, vague and possibly vacuous, and the early Wittgenstein, together perhaps with the middle Russell, improved matters by introducing uh, a notion of isomorphism or of structural identity between uh, language or thought on the one hand, reality on the other, thereby giving content to this notion of correspondence. Uh, and so recently that was really, you know, uh, the only voice view. And many Wittgenstein commentators have not ascribed the correspondence theory to the tractatus, but they have s simply remained silent on the issue. It's only very recently that some people have denied that there's a correspondence theory in the tractatus. Um, the German philosopher Ansgar Beckermann uh, is one of them, and Peter Hacker has changed his mind on this issue. Um, and if you look at the... Uh, and uh, uh, what uh, both Beckerman and Hacker claim is that although the Tractatus involves a correspondence theory, it's a correspondence theory of meaning or, or sense, not of truth. 
The theory of truth that they detect in the, in the Tractatus is a semantic theory according to uh, Beckermann and a deflationary theory according to Hacker. But I hope to show later that you know, this apparent uh, divergence between the two is actually uh, just apparent. Okay, now, you know, th these interventions by Beckermann and Hacker raise the topic to which, uh, you know, uh, my talk is devoted. Uh, namely, does the Tractatus indeed propound a correspondence theory of truth? And if not, what is the Tractatus account of truth? And my answer to these two questions will differ both from the standard correspondence interpretation and from the alternatives uh, of <coughs> Beckermann and Hacker. In particular, I shall argue for the following <coughs> theses, and there's actually a rather a lot of them. I hope that this is visible. I shall argue that standard correspondence interpretations are indeed mistaken because the isomorphism <coughs> you find in the spectators is a precondition of sense rather than truth. Secondly, I'll argue that there are in the early work both passages favoring a semantic or deflationary interpretation and passages favoring a correspondence interpretation. Thirdly, I shall argue that there is an official theory of truth in the Tractatus, and that official theory is an obtainment theory of truth. A sentence is true if the state of affairs it depicts actually obtains. And I will then try to show that this uh, obtainment theory of truth is actually close not just to semantic or deflationary theories, but also to certain versions of the correspondence theory. Uh, fourthly, the um, obtainment theory does involve a relation of correspondence. But, and I think this is very important, this relation is not a truth-making relation. It's a relation of depiction. However, I shall argue the idea of the kind of uh, truth-making relation that many correspondence theorists want is incoherent, and this kind of truth rate making relation does actually not feature or does not feature essentially in the theories of Moore and Russell. So if Moore and Russell held a correspondence theory, then I think the, the Tractatus held a correspondence theory. But I want to move beyond that in my final thesis, um, and there I claim that uh, semantic, deflationary, and correspondence theories are not necessarily incompatible. I think uh, they can all combine what I call a semantic component <coughs> and a deflationary component. So, you know, I am arguing for an irenic conclusion here. So, the structure of the paper is that I shall first briefly mention uh, certain varieties of correspondence theories. And in the second section, I want to show why uh, you might think that the Tractatus um, marks important improvements over received uh, versions of the correspondence theory, or rather, the received at the time of the Tractatus. Um, then, in section three, I shall show that the standard correspondence interpretation is untenable. And in section four, I shall uh, discuss the semantic stroke deflationary alternative. In section five, I come to my, my baby, so to speak, the official theory of truth in the tractate, the obtainment theory. And in section six, I will uh, uh, try to explain what it means that the correspondence you find in the tractatus is not a truth-making relation, but a relation of depiction. And then finally, in section seven, I will, I hope, reach my irenic conclusion. Okay. Um, so I will you know, now briefly talk about uh, different versions of the correspondence theory. Now, uh, the thing that makes correspondence theories uh, so uh, I shall use uh, acronyms uh, which are you know, part of that unique aesthetic appeal that analytic philosophy has. Uh, for reasons of space, I assure you. Um, so, AR, as you should have guessed, uh, is short for Alethic Realism. Uh, not Athletic Realism, as it's sometimes called. Uh, Alethic Realism is, you know, not a very muscular affair. Uh, all it insists on is that 
what is true is independent of what we say or believe. It's independent of what we uh, say or believe to be true. So, you know, I've tried to uh, condense this. Uh, so it's not the case that the fact that it is true that P entails that it is believed that P, and it's also not the case that the fact that it is believed that P entails that it is true that P. Now, that seems to me dead right and gives correspondence theories, this sort of intuition gives correspondence theories the edge over pragmatist <coughs> or coherence theory. However, <coughs> the correspondence theory courts trouble, so to speak, by moving beyond this alethic uh, realism. Um, and I take it to be essential to correspondence theory, CT, that truth is a relation between a truth bearer, on the one hand, and a truth maker, on the other. And all three ideas here, then the idea of a truth bearer, the idea of a truth maker, and the idea of a relation, you know, can cause difficulties. Now, in uh, my talk, I shall simply take for granted that the truth bearers are sentences. That's simply a heuristic move because it helps me to il illustrate the tractator's position. Because to discuss the tractators, I must be able to talk about the relation between a sentence and what the sentence says, and the relation between what the sentence says and what is the case if the sentence is true. So, you know, I'm not making a claim that the real truth bearers are sentences. On the contrary, I think that's actually wrong, but I think it will do for my purposes. Um, the next move is to consider various versions of the correspondence theory. Now, the traditional version of the correspondence theory, the one uh, that you can find in Aristotle and Aquinas, uh, is what I call object correspondence. Um, uh, and it's a uh, now largely ignored position. Uh, object correspondence, or OC, uh, holds it that a sentence S is true if and only if S corresponds to its object. What that means is that the sentence, and more, uh, more specifically the predicate of the sentence, fits the subject of the sentence. It fits what the sentence is about. So, for example, uh, the sentence uh, Bush is American is true because the predicate is American fits Bush. Now, it seems to me that object correspondence is neither vague nor vacuous. Uh, if it has a problem, then it's uh, the need to specify a subject for every true sentence. Yeah? Uh, object correspondence works if for every true sentence you can say, well, here is the subject that it is about, and there's the predicate. And that becomes very difficult, for example, with sentences like, it is raining, or unicorns don't exist. And perhaps it's possible to, to conjure up a subject here, but it's at any rate not uh, easy. Now, uh, the, the need to specify such a subject is avoided by fact-oriented or fact-based correspondence theories. And these are the sorts of theories that Moore and Russell pioneered uh, at the turn of the last century. Um, fact uh, correspondence theories also come in various shapes and sizes. Uh, the first one I call fact correspondence <coughs> plural, or FCP as is its term of endearment. Um, and according to uh, FCP, S is true if and only if S corresponds to the facts. Yeah, facts, plural. Now, this uh, theory avoids the difficulty of having to specify uh, you know, a subject. You know, it is raining or um, uh, unicorns uh, don't exist. You know, can correspond to the facts even if there's no particular a subject for these sentences. Um, if FCP has a drawback, it is that it seems to be slightly trivial or vacuous. You may wonder, you know, is that uh, really more than a roundabout way of saying that S is true? Um, this problem is uh, <coughs> avoided by the next version, which is uh, fact correspondence singular. According to fact correspondence singular, S is true if and only if S corresponds to the fact it expresses. So fact singular and a very specific relation between the sentence and the fact it expresses. But FCS runs into uh, trouble when it comes to accounting for falsehood. According to 
to HCS being true is a matter of a sentence standing in one sort of relation to the fact it expresses and therefore being false must be a matter of the sentence standing in another kind of relation to the fact it expresses. But of course if S is false there is no such fact. Now, if S is false then it does not express a fact. So uh, FCS, the idea that true or false is a matter of two different relations to one and the same thing uh, is flawed. And this might, might finally uh, uh, motivate us to move to FCE or fact correspondence existence. And according to fact correspondence existence, S is true if and only if there is a fact to which S corresponds. And obviously that doesn't raise the problem that FCS has because uh, in, the, in case of S being false, there will not be a fact to which S corresponds. The problem with FCE is you know, the traditional problem, namely that it involves a notion of correspondence that uh, remains unexplained. Okay, so this is the background uh, of theories of truth. And at this point, you might say, uh, the Tractatus comes into view. Um, I think it's plausible or tempting, and perhaps true, to regard the Tractatus, but I must keep some of my powder dry here, um, to, oops, to regard the Tractatus as an improvement over the kind of correspondence theory you find in Moore and Russell. Uh, and it, so to speak, improves on all three fronts, on truth makers, truth bearers, and uh, the relation of correspondence. Firstly, as regards truth makers, um, Moore and Russell tended to treat facts as complexes of objects, or complexes of terms. Uh, the Tractatus, uh, by contrast, was adamant uh, in insisting that there's a sharp distinction between facts or states of affairs on the one hand, objects and complexes of objects on the other. And this is, of course, helpful in our context because if you assimilate facts to objects, then you run the danger of actually uh, obliterating the difference between an object uh, version of the correspondence theory and a fact version of the correspondence theory. Uh, B, the Tractatus might also be seen to improve on, on Moore and Russell as regards the truth bearers. Uh, Russell and Moore uh, uh, used propositions in that role, and you know, I have absolutely nothing against that. Uh, you know, I think that's, uh, in a way, uh, dead right. The problem is that, at least at some stages, Moore and Russell identified facts and true propositions and they created all manner of problems uh, for themselves. And the second problem is that they treated propositions as complex abstract entities. Uh, the Tractatus, by the contrast, ascribes truth to Sätze. Now the German term Satz is ambiguous as between sentence and proposition. And uh, Wittgenstein you know, is quite aware of all the different uh, connotations here. He distinguishes <coughs> sharply between the Satzzeichen, the sentential sign, and the genuine sentence, usually translated as, as proposition. Um, what distinguishes a, a mere Satzzeichen, a mere sentential sign, from a genuine uh, <coughs> sentence or uh, Satz is not that uh, the Satz is associated with an abstract entity, but rather that the Satz is used to say something. A sentence is a sentential sign in its projective relation to reality. Uh, a sentence is simply uh, a sentential sign, a, a sound or inscription that we use to say something. And finally, C, uh, the picture theory seems to you know, do what the correspondence theory urgently requires, namely it seems to <coughs> explain what this notion, this relation of correspondence between the sentence and uh, the fact or reality actually amounts to. And it does so by invoking uh, a relation of isomorphism, a relation of structural identity uh, between sentences and 
situation. So I think, um, for reasons of time, I shall not read out the, uh, the quote, but um, actually, I want to keep all of that in view. Right. Um, now, you know, I find it very tempting to regard the Tractatus as improving on, on Warren Gosling on these three points. But the last point, C, is also the point at which uh, standard co uh, correspondence interpretations of the Tractatus go astray. Because what standard correspondence interpretations of the Tractatus do is they regard uh, the isomorphism uh, between a sentence and what it depicts as an explanation of truth. And this is wrong, mm -hmm. um, as I hope to show. The standard correspondence interpretations, and you know, I can give chapters and verse for this, is roughly uh, SI. S is true if and only if S is isomorphic to what S depicts. Now, but that is dead wrong because uh, every sentence, including false sentences, is, according to the spectators, isomorphic to what it depicts. And uh, to demonstrate this, um, have a look at <coughs> the, uh, the handout uh, on page two, uh, where I have a couple of quotes to substantiate this claim. <coughs> 2.161. There must be something identical in the picture and what it depicts to enable the one to be a picture of the other at all. 2.17. What the picture must have in common with reality in order to be able to depict it correctly or incorrectly in the way it does is its form of depiction. 2.22 The picture represents what it represents independently of its truth or falsehood through its form of depiction. So whether or not a sentence is true or false, yeah, it is isomorphic with the state of affairs that it depicts. So isomorphism is, if you wish, an explanation. It's a sufficient condition not of <coughs> a sentence saying something true, but uh, a, a, an explanation of the sentence saying something at all, truly or falsely. So it seems to me that you know, uh, the, the standard interpretation really uh, won't do. Um, and therefore, I think we are well advised to turn to the alternative uh, sketched by uh, Beckerman and Hacker. Um, now, there are you know, plenty of passages to support, uh, well, plenty, that's an exaggeration, but there are uh, plenty of passages <coughs> to support uh, uh, their uh, view of things, and I've listed them under uh, section four on the handout. Um, from the notebooks. P is true, says nothing else but P. That's about as clear a statement of the redundancy theory as you are likely to find anywhere. Um, I'll leave out the <coughs> passage uh, turning to the Tractatus itself, 4.062. A proposition is true if we use it to say that things stand in a certain way, and they do. Now, I think that uh, this, uh, the, the last passage in particular, uh, supports something like the following attribution to the tractatus. And I call it S strong B. A sentence S is true if and only if things are as S says they are. Um, now, uh, Beckerman thinks that something like SD, and, and I'm putting words in both of their mouths, but uh, something like SD is a semantic theory because it involves a semantic notion like saying. Hacker, on the other hand, thinks it's deflationary theory because there's no truth-making relation here in SD between uh, a sentence and a fact that makes the sentence true. It's just a, in my view, very attractive, uh, very um, modest uh, account of truth. So why not rest with you know, this uh, <coughs> SD, however appallingly labeled? Um, why not you know, say, well, that is the end of the matter? Well, it seems to me uh, there's at least one good reason uh, for moving on, and that is that 
In Wittgenstein's early work, you also find passages that favor a correspondence interpretation, passages that are not accounted for by uh, the semantic stroke deflationary interpretation. Um, and I uh, you know, would like you to turn to the handout again, section five, under the official theory of TLP. 2.21. A picture agrees with reality or fails to agree. It is correct or incorrect, true or false. 2.222. The agreement or disagreement of its sense with reality constitutes its truth or falsity. And 2.223. In order to tell whether a picture is true or false, <coughs> we must compare it with reality. Now, it seems to me these are passages that would grace any correspondence theory, you know, quite apart from uh, you know, this idea of comparing uh, uh, the picture with the reality. What these passages explicitly do is they identify being true with a being in agreement with reality and being false with being in disagreement with reality. So the problem we have uh, with the standard interpretation, namely that uh, you know, what it involves, the notion of isomorphism, uh, is you know, uh, necessary for both true and false sentences, does not arise here. Um, the, the root point when we read the passages up to 2.223 is, well, what does this agreement with reality amount to? What does it mean to say that a true sentence agrees with reality? Now, uh, I think that the Tractatus provides an answer to this question, and it provides an answer uh, in uh, two passages that are listed just beneath uh, on the handout. 4.21, the simplest kind of proposition, an elementary proposition, asserts the obtaining, <coughs> bestehen, of a state of affairs. 4.25, if an elementary proposition is true, the state of affairs obtains. If an elementary proposition is false, the state of affairs does not obtain. Now, um, uh, the first time I gave this paper, Johann Schulte pointed out to me that you know, this holds only for elementary propositions, and I was sort of, you know, pursuing my line sort of un un encumbered by such subtleties. Uh, but you know, I think that once we've reached this point with 4.25. There are really three possible lines that we could pursue. One is to take into account the recursive nature of the Tractatus. Just as the, the, the account of sense in the Tractatus is recursive, in that the sense of molecular propositions is explained by reference to the sense of elementary propositions, so the account of truth it is recursive. So you might say, well, this is the account for elementary propositions. Uh, a molecular proposition is true if its truth grounds, those assignments of truth values to its elementary uh, components under which it comes out as true, actually obtain. So you know, we can take into account uh, the recursive nature here. I don't want to do that because the recursive theory of the Tractatus seems to me obviously flawed. You, know, you cannot explain or uh, um, complex propositions by reference to elementary propositions truth functionally combined. The second alternative here would be to say, look, okay, state of affairs are associated with elementary propositions, but the Tractatus also features a term, <coughs> maybe the term situation, that seems, at any rate, to apply both to elementary and to molecular propositions. And so you might say, well, look, <coughs> A sentence period is true if the situation it depicts obtains. <coughs> um, I've opted for version C because I really want to uh, you know, bring the tractatus close to current thinking about truth, and I will just use the notion of a state of affairs in a, you know, a way that is generalized beyond the tractatus. So you know, for me, a state of affairs is simply a possibility, a possible way things might be, and therefore I arrive at what I call the official theory of truth in the Tractatus, which is also an obtainment theory. So, you know, OT is just the ticket. So, OT is the official theory uh, in the Tractatus, uh, and the OT uh, runs 
S is true if and only if the state of affairs S depicts actually obtains. All right. Now, what are we to make of uh, OT? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and at first sight, it's a distinctive theory of truth. I mean, it's, you, know, it's, you can't uh, simply reduce it to uh, deflationary theory. You can't simply reduce it to uh, standard versions of the correspondence theory. Uh, but you actually, as I, I try to show now, you can actually transform OT into a version of the correspondence theory, and it's actually rather simple. Uh, Okay, the first step is uh, just a grammatical variant on our OT. Uh, S is true if and only if S depicts an obtaining state of affairs. Now, uh, an obtaining state of affairs, according to the tractatus, <coughs> is a fact. <coughs> S is true if and only if S depicts a fact. <coughs> Um, again, a, a grammatical variation of this, but an important variation, is OT3. S is true if and only if there is a fact, S depicts. And, and now, I don't know what kind of bells, you might say alarm bells should be ringing, but some sort of bell should be ringing, because OT3 is actually very close indeed to FCE. You know, replace uh, depicts by corresponds, and you have the same theories. S is true if and only if there's a fact to which S corresponds. So if you gloss corresponds as depicts, you can move from FCE to the obtainment theory, and if you then conversely you gloss depicts as corresponds, you can move the other way. So uh, it seems to me uh, that that is the connection between Wittgenstein's official theory of truth and one version of the correspondence theory. Right. So you know this is really the punchline for me. You know you can conf uh, transform what is without doubt the official theory into a version of the correspondence theory. Um, now of course things are a bit trickier uh, than that because I must make a concession right at the beginning. Namely, the correspondence relation that is being invoked here, correspondence as depiction relation, is not a truth-making relation. Uh, so you know, the correspondence relation of FCE and the depiction relation of OT is not a truth-making relation between a sentence and the fact it depicts. It's you know, the relation of uh, depicting the state of affairs with which uh, the sentence is associated, the state of affairs uh, that uh, the sentence is projected onto. A sentence is true if it is, if it depicts the right kind of states of affairs, you might say, although Wittgenstein would hate that. A sentence is true if the state of affairs it depicts obtains or actually obtains. Now, I uh, might say, okay, well, that, but that's no good. I mean, that me really means it is not a correspondence theory, because a correspondence theory uh, uh, revolves around the idea that the, the relation of correspondence is a truth-making relation. And, you know, if you're so inclined, you know, I, obviously I, uh, I cannot decide terminological matters uh, through a knockdown argument. But uh, uh, it's worth pointing out that uh, the idea of this kind of truth-making relation, the idea of a truth-making relation between a sentence and the fact it expresses is incoherent. That's exactly the, the, the relation that uh, uh, was invoked in FCS. A sentence is S is true if and only if S corresponds to the fact S expresses. And this kind of theory is wrong, and Wittgenstein actually saw that it must be wrong. <coughs> It must not be overlooked that a proposition has a sense that is independent of the facts. Otherwise, one can easily suppose that true and false are relations of equal status between signs and what they signify. In that case, one could say, for example, that P signifies in the true way what not P signifies in the false way. Right. Uh, but you know, this is just the wrong picture here. You know, uh, a sentence 
stands in just one relation to what it signifies and the point here is that P and not P signify something different. It's not that not P signifies in the true way what P signifies in, uh, in the false way or what P signifies in the true way or conversely. So uh, this particular kind of truth making, there are various kinds of truth making as uh, people who are familiar with the Austrian uh, uh, tradition uh, know, um, this kind of truth making is incoherent. Now does that mean that the Tractatus you know, after all does not hold a correspondence theory? Well I don't think so and I was intrigued by the following quotation uh, from Moore. Uh, it comes from a lecture delivered in 1911 but was only published in 1911. 53, and this seems to me so sensible that it was bound to be forgotten in subsequent discussions. And Moore says, to say that this belief is true is to say that there is in the universe a fact to which it corresponds. And to say that it is false is to say that there is not in the universe any fact to which it corresponds. And Moore goes on to say well, that the notion of correspondence here is sui generis, you cannot explain it. And it seems to me that uh, the tractatus can be seen as an attempt to pick up that challenge. You can explain the notion of correspondence here. Everything comes out right if you, uh, you know, explain correspondence as depiction and explain depiction in the manner of the picture theory. Okay, so you know, uh, my challenge uh, would be well, you know, if more, you know, doesn't have a truth-making relation, um, uh, uh, then the fact that the Tractatus doesn't have a truth-making relation, you know, should not show that um, it's not a correspondence theory, because otherwise you would have to say that more did hold a correspondence theory. And I think something similar can be done for Russell, but that's uh, beyond my powers of presentation. Um, so, you know, you might say, well, you know, it is a correspondence theory, but perhaps there is, you know, an even more fruitful way of, of looking at this, uh, also fruitful, I think, with respect to looking at the later Wittgenstein, um, if you look at these different theories, uh, I think it should strike you that there is a common element here. Um, I think that semantic deflationary and correspondence theory are not necessarily incompatible. Now, I think this, this much is granted tacitly very often in discussions of truth you have, so to speak, correspondence, semantic and deflationary theories, and then, you know, in one chapter, and then what I would, would call wild theories of truth, like the coherence theory, or the consensus theory, or pragmatist theories, <coughs> in another chapter. Um, they belong together simply because they pay heed to my elithic realism. But I think there's a more, there's a more uh, striking uh, uh, parallel here, and you can split all of the uh, sentences for, tr you know, accounts of truth for sentences <coughs> that I've discussed into two parts. The first part explains the relation between a sentence and what it says or depicts in the fashion of a semantic theory, loosely speaking, because these are semantic notions. And uh, the second part explains the agreement between what the sentence says and what is the case if it is true in a deflationary manner because you know, this agreement is a very insubstantial affair. It's the agreement between the sentence saying that grass is green and it being a fact that grass is green. Um, and uh, you know, nothing very exciting here. So um, you know, I think that is a possible, I think that is a very defensible account of uh, uh, truth for sentences provided you can explain what the fiction is. <coughs> Um, now, you know, we might various, have various steps at this, um, but you know, I'm, I don't put much weight on this. All I'm trying is to keep my nose clean here, yeah, really. Uh, but you know, if you wanted to uh, formalize this, or go some way towards formalizing this, you might say uh, X is true, and this could be for any uh, truth there. X is true if and only if A, X depicts the state of affairs, and B, that state of affairs contains. <coughs> Now, you might have forms about quantifying over states of affairs uh, in the same manner as you quantify over objects. You might think that objectual quantification is unsuited here, uh, and then you can adopt something like uh, propositional or sentential quantification. Um, and then you will get something like S is true if and only if there is a state of affairs that P, 
or P, I'm never quite sure about that, such that S says that P and P. Mm. Now I think that works, but even if it doesn't, I hope to have shown that if you look at the tractatus, you can see that uh, certain versions of the correspondence, the semantic and the deflationary theory are not incompatible, but that they may be best seen as different ways of expressing an important truth about truth. Thank you.